Brother Cliff, you want to take up a mission offering for us? We finally got through with chapter 34. It, it took a long time to get through 34. Uh, we may move a little bit faster, and we may not move a little bit faster. Uh, we'll just see how that works out. I'm, I'm in no hurry. I found out a long time ago I'm not going to be able to preach every word of this Bible. Not in my lifetime. There's no way to get it done. So we're just going to take our time, make sure that we rightly divide the word of truth and get, get you a little bit of help. Now, Moses has come down off of Mount Sinai. And chapter number 35 begins with this. He First thing he did, he gathered all the congregation of the children of Israel together. He brought every one of them into one place. Uh, he's got the word of God. God has given him what he wants him to have. Now he's bringing the people all together. So we find the gathering of God's people. And then this is what he said unto them. Verse 1, these are the words. I want you to notice the word words. What's he talking about? Individual words. All right, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. The Bible said, "Holy men of old spake, as they were moved by the Holy Ghost of God." What we have is verbal inspiration, word by word. Uh, these people changing all these Bibles. When you change the word, words, you're changing what God said. To some degree, you are changing for the better or for the worse, and you can't do it for the better, so what you've got is confusion today. If the words are God, the Bible said over in the book of Proverbs, chapter number 30, every word of God is pure. So we find he's going to give them not the thoughts, not the gist of things, all right? Uh, come down and... Uh, say, well, I forgot uh, what God said, so I'm just going to give you the gist of what he said. Uh, that's what you get today out of a lot of pulpits. He came down with the words of God. He said, these are the words which the Lord hath commanded that ye shall do them. Now, what he's going to do, God's given him the instruction. He's given him the moral law. He's given him in here the civil law. He'll give the ceremonial law. Most of that will be in the book of Leviticus, so we're not really going to deal so much with ceremonial law, but he gave them the moral law, chapter 20, then the civil law, how they interact with each other. The, the ceremonial law is how you interact with God. So what? notice what he said. The first thing he says is six days shall work be done. Now he's going, what they're going to do, they're going to build a tabernacle in the wilderness, the tabernacle of the congregation. But he's laying down the law. Listen, sometimes I hate to have a job looking me in the face. I don't know how you are. I'll get out. I just, if I've got to do 10 jobs in one day, I hate to put something off. If I've got something I've got to do, I'd really just go ahead and jump on that thing and do it. Well, when they're building this tabernacle, once they get into the actual building of this thing, listen, they're liable to work seven days a week, 24 hours a day if you're not careful. So he's setting down a strict law with them. Notice what he said. Six days shall work be done. But on the seventh day there shall be to you an holy day, a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Notice it's not necessarily even a rest of the body. Even though I think you need to rest your body, I think you need to take a day a week and you need to rest your body. The Sabbath was a rest to the Lord. That means you quit your servile work, your, your work that you do, and on that seventh day you rest to the Lord. You, you stop that work and you dedicate yourself to the Lord. That's what the Sabbath was all about. When, when the Lord rested on the seventh day, in six days and six nights he made the heaven and the earth and all that in them is, the Bible said he rested on the seventh. He didn't rest because he was tired. <laughs> he rest because he was finished, all right? He was done with his work. Now, he's telling them this Sabbath of rest is to the Lord. In other words, you're to dedicate yourself to God on that day. 
The Sabbath was given under the law. Today we have Sunday. Sunday ought to be a rest to the Lord. It's something that at time we take time to spend time with God. That's what he's talking about here. Now, notice what he said in verse 2. Whosoever doeth work therein shall be put to death. Friend, under the law, eight. Thank God you're not under the law. Now, you've got a lot of cults uh, uh, trying, we're in Exodus 35. You've got a lot of cults today that try and take you back underneath the law. We're, on, we're in the age of grace. Uh, the Bible said that God has given us liberty. It's not liberty to sin, it's liberty to serve. A lot of people say, well, if I'm set at liberty, I can do whatever I want to. That's not biblical. As God's children, we do what God wants us to do, not what we want to do, all right? But it's liberty to serve. Matter of fact, uh, one of our songs that we sing about America, you find your liberty in what? Law. Liberty's in law. We live in lawless days. People try and do away with the law. Listen, you have no liberty with no law. The only liberty you have is in law, and that's what America said, and that's what God set up. Now, he said, if you work on that seventh day, you want to know what God thought about it, God said you're going to die. You'll be put to death if you do that. There are several things in the Bible God put death sentence on, and this is one of them. Notice, he said in verse 3, Ye shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations on the Sabbath day. What was the problem with the fire? They didn't need it for warmth. They're in the desert. <laughs> that fire was made to work with. Fire is a tool. Always has been a tool, folks. It's a tool. You cook with it. You do things. My grandfather was a blacksmith. He used a fire in order to uh, change metal. Boy, it always interested me how he could just cover that fire up. He could put ashes on that fire, bank that thing, but all he had to do was poke it two or three times and hit that billows about four or five times, and he could turn a piece of steel white hot quicker than you could say scat. I mean, they built that up. Fire was a tool to be used. It's always been a tool to be used. So he said, you don't even kindle it. You don't lay it out. You don't do anything with it. You just leave it alone. The seventh day is a day of rest. The reason he's doing that, they're going to build this tabernacle. It's going to be a job, and he's going to build it. Now, look in verse number 4. And Moses spake unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord commanded, saying. Now, in verse number 5, he's going to give them a commandment. This is not their druthers. We used to have a hamburger place in Kentucky called Druthers. Anybody ever seen one of them? Maybe that's kind of particular. It was called Druthers. And it, a pretty good hamburger place. I'd, I'd, I'd rather have McDonald's or something. But uh, So that's what Druthers was. He'd say that. But he, he didn't tell them, you do what you want. What he's going to tell them is a commandment of God. It's one that today people just kind of forsake. Now notice what he said in verse number 5. This is the commandment. Take ye from a, among yourselves an offering unto the Lord. From among yourself, not from outside. Now, let me help you with something with what God did. Before they ever got to this point and even knew God was going to build a tabernacle in the congregation, God allowed them to spoil the Egyptians. They borrowed from the Egyptians anything they wanted. The Egyptians gave it to them because God worked on their heart. And hey, I'm telling you, everything that they needed to build this tabernacle was already in their hands. They didn't have to go out looking for things to build a tabernacle with. It was already there. So he said a principle, and that, that principle is simply that if whatever is needed spiritually to take care of God's business, God's people already have. I've never been one to take up a lot of special offerings. I hope you've noticed that over the years. Uh, some churches, every time you turn around, they're taking up a special offering. I believe God's tithes and offerings should be enough to take care of the work of God. 
I think that's the way it is. We don't have yard sales and pancake breakfasts. We don't go to Walmart and sell donuts and do, do all this extracurricular stuff in order to take care of what needs to be taken care of within the church. We got a lot of churches today. I never buy their donuts. A lot of times they sell them up there at Walmart. You go by selling donuts up there for the church, and I just go by and, I, you know, I, I don't do it, but I want to ask them, is your God really that broke? <laughs> that you got to sell donuts or you got to sell candy or you got to have a yard sale or a bazaar or whatever in order to take care of business. A lot of churches do that. We don't do that here. He said, you take among you an offering unto the Lord. Now, I want you to notice the word offering. Offering is not a tithe. Offering is above a tithe. This is not them tithing to the, to, to the work of God. That tithing was already established. A tithe and an offering is offering something that's above. You can't give an offering until you've already put your tithe in. If you don't put your tithe in, then that's not an offering. It's just part of what you already owed God to begin with. All right, there's a difference between it. That's why he said in Malachi chapter 3, people said, wherein have we robbed God? He said, in tithes and what? Offerings. What's an offering? You say an offering is what God tells you to give or lays you on your heart to do that. We uh, put money in tithe in the general offering and we put money in for missions and some special every now and then or whatever. These are offerings that are given to God. The, the tithe belongs to the Lord, but the offering is something that God sometimes requires us to do. Matter of fact, if you go to the Old Testament, you find out the tithe and the offering were equal. So we find an offering unto the Lord, and you're supposed to take that offering from the congregation of people. Now look in verse 5 again. Whosoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it. Whosoever is, hey, you know what that tells me? That tells me there are a lot of people in the congregation of Israel that didn't bring anything to help make the tabernacle with. He said, I don't want you to coerce an offering out of somebody. <clears throat> I've been in some revivals where they uh, spent 30 minutes taking up an offering. Anybody ever been in one of them? I, hey, they'll, beg, they'll beg you shoes. They'll beg you. <laughs> you get out, out of there if you've got your clothes on your back, you've done real well. I, I knew people that used to. They wouldn't even take any money to, to them other than what they was going to put in the offering plate because they'd get it out of you before it was over with. They just, what they're doing, they're begging for God. Listen, I want, I want you to understand something. God is not broke. If I ever have to beg for God, then I'm going to get a legitimate job someplace and get out of the ministry. Listen, I do not beg for God. God owns the cattle of a thousand hills. So he said... I just want the willing heart. You know, the Bible said in the New Testament that God loves a cheerful giver. He said we're not to give of necessity and all these things. He said we give as a cheerful giver. We give something to the Lord. One of the greatest thrills in my life, it, it takes place on Saturday night. Saturday night, fill out tithe checks and get everything ready for the house of God. And boy, just love it. Now, he's talking that he wants a free will offering. I remember when Barbara and I were out of church, neither one of us were saved. You know, we got married. We just drifted. We got out of church. And I remember one time that the deacons from the, uh, the church that, we, that I grew up in came and knocked on the door of our mobile home. And they came in. They, they didn't even invite us to church. They were building a new building, and they were trying to get people to promise to give so much money toward that building. I'll never forget that. They didn't even invite a young couple to church. They didn't care about anything but the money. Listen, this is a free will thing. Offerings are free will. It's something that God's people do. Now, whosoever is of a willing heart, so that just, you can read, sometimes in the Bible, you can read what it doesn't say. So it says, whosoever is not of a willing heart, you keep what you got. Well, baby, you don't want to give, don't. 
is in te- hey, now you won't hear that out of a lot of pulpits. I tell people, if you don't want to give, just quit. Just stop. Hey, just take it home. Hey, go out and uh, buy you a new car with it. Buy whatever you want with it. You do whatever you want. That's what he's telling them. These are willing people. So there are some people that will. There are some that won't. Now, he said, second thing, let him bring it. <clears throat> means you don't go out and solicit it. My, let him bring it. He said that in Malachi. He said that you're to bring those tithes and offerings to the house of the Lord. That's, and by the way, you're not supposed to tithe outside of a local church. Local church is where the tithe goes. It's where it, it doesn't go to some evangelist or missionary or somebody else. It is to be brought into the house of God. Now, I understand sometimes we've got shut-ins, and shut-ins are not able to get there, and then they'll send their tithe in. That's, that's fine. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about soliciting outside of the church. The people were to bring it to the house of God, to bring this offering, and then he, he started at the top. <clears throat> What's the most precious thing they've got? Gold. And then he starts down with silver. If you don't have gold, bring your silver. If you don't have silver, bring your brass. Verse 6, he starts dealing with things that it's going to take to build this tabernacle in, of the congregation in the wilderness. God knows everything that they need. He knows that they have it, and he knows that the willing people are the ones that are going to be able to take care of it. They take care of it. Now, notice a listing. Gold, silver, brass, verse 6, blue, purple, scarlet. He was talking, hey, fine linen, goat's hair, ram skin dyed red, badger skin, shittim wood, the oil for the light, the spices for the anointing oil, for the sweet incense, onyx stones, stones to be set for the ephod, for the breastplate. He's, he's listing these things that they are going to need, but they are things that they already have. These are, these are highly prized things that they have, and he tells them, now we're going to bring them. If you've got a willing heart, you bring them in. Verse 10, And every wise-hearted among you shall come and make all that the Lord hath commanded. The second thing, one, the finances were already there. Now, also, the people to get the job done were already there. I believe that God puts in churches a lot of people that are skilled in different areas. You've got some that can do electrical work, some that can be, do carpentry work, some that can do plumbing work. I think everybody's married can do plumbing work, right? You men like that, huh? taking commodes up and putting new seals on. I despise I don't mind electrical. I really don't. As long as they don't come and inspect it, we're good to go. I can make it work. It may not be the code. You go up to the top and you'll find wire nuts with tape around them hanging everywhere. You know, I try to put them in junction boxes and try to button them up right. But I believe in the local church that God has everything that needs to be there in order to run the local church. These were wise-hearted people. That means they could do various things everybody has a skill set <clears throat> my little brother he may be listening uh sometimes he listens to school hi ron if you're listening now i'm going to talk about you a little bit he he made a statement that i think it was ron that basically anybody could do anything if they had the right tools to work with no 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 <laughs> You can give me some right tools, and I'm not very skilled with those things in different areas, all right? I know Ron is. He's very skilled in that area, and he's got all types of woodworking things. But at the same time, everybody in the church has a skill set. Everybody here, hey, we're adults in here. You've learned something in your life that you're good at doing. There's a lot of things I'm not good at doing, especially now. The older I get, I can't hold on to things with my hands I can hold on out here but boy I drop the the boy you start working with a little nut to try to put it on a screw or what I'll drop it a half a dozen times before a lot of times I just set the nut down and just try to screw the screw into it to get that thing started the reason why I can't do it anymore but we've got people that can't one they had everything they needed within that local church 
to build that church. You understand? They had everything they needed. Second thing, they had everybody they needed. They had people that could do these jobs and do these jobs. He talked about every wise hearted among you shall come and make all that the Lord hath commanded. Now, where are they going to make the tabernacle? His tent. I want you to notice that pronoun that's put in front of the tent. It's not their tent. The tabernacle was his tent, all right? That's what the work is around here. This is not my church. This is not your church. This is God's church. Everybody understands that? Now, we, hey, listen, this belongs to the Lord. Years ago, they had this property in the name of the deacons and trustees of the church. We took that out a long time ago. It's in the name of Temple Baptist Church. It's not in my name. It's not in your name. It's not in the deacon's name. This church is in the hands of the church itself. So he said, it, he said, I want you to ever wise hearted. I want this tabernacle, his tent. Notice what he says. His coverings, his tatches, his boards, his bars, his pillars, his socket, his pews. You understand what he's saying? That's why we need to respect the house of God. Some piece of paper on the floor, pick it up. You see a light bulb burn out? Don't call the preacher. Got light bulbs in here. Got a pole to take them down. What? Take them out and change that thing. This belongs to God. I believe it needs to be respected that way. I've seen so many people just absolutely disrespect the house of God. They, listen, we don't want it to fall down. We don't want it to come apart. We want to take care of it and keep it nice for the Lord. It belongs to Him. He used that word, His, 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 His. It's His house, all right? Now, verse number 12, he said, Now the articles that go in the house, the ark, the staves thereof with the mercy seat and the veil of the covering, the table, his staves, all of his vessels, and the showbread, the candlestick also for the light, and his furniture and his lamps with the oil for the light, the incense altar, his staves, the anointing oil, the sweet incense, and the hanging for the door to entering into the tabernacle, the altar of burnt offering with his brazen gate, staves, all his vessels, the lavers, his foot, the hangings of the court, his pillars and their sockets and the hangings for the door of the court, the pins of the tabernacle, the pins of the court and their cords, the cloths for service, to do service in the holy place. That even goes to the garments, the holy garments for Aaron the priest and his garments of his sons to minister in the priest's office. He's naming everything that they're going to build. They've already got the material that they need to build it with, and they have the skill set to get it done, both men and women. Who's going to do the sewing for the priest? These women had a major part. They made that veil. They, they had a major part in the building of the tabernacle of the congregation because women have a skill set that I don't have. You can take the best sewing machine in the world and set me in front of that thing, and I don't know what to do with it. Now, we live in a day when a lot of the young women don't know what to do with it anymore, all right? I remember when I was a little boy, women sat around and knitted and crocheted and did tatting and uh, boy, there's all types. To, my mother's hands were always busy. Uh, she made homemade quilts. She made afghans. She made throws. Uh, uh, Mom could knit or sew anything that needed to be sewed. As long as she lived, a lady up in New York State someplace, every quilt and afghan and things that my mother made, all she had to do was put it in a box and send it up there to her and she wrote her a check. She was making big money off of hand-sewn quilts and things. You know, you get all this factory stitching and buy quilts today. They don't have good quality to them. I remember the, the quilting frames that hung between. We, we lived in what's called a shotgun house. You know what that is. You can stand the front door and shoot a shotgun through the back door in the back. My younger brother and I slept in a hall that was just a wide, it was part of that shotgun effect up there. 
and they sit down on our beds. I remember last time I looked in that old house, the hooks for the quilting frames were still there. Well, they let the ladies would come up from all, all up and down Wilson Street, and they'd set up there, and they'd work together, skill set. They had the money. They had everything they needed. They had the skill set in order to take care of it. Now look at verse 20. And all the congregation of the children of Israel departed from the presence of Moses. Now he's commanded them what God said. Now they depart out of his presence and they go back to their house. Notice in verse 21. And they came. Everyone whose heart stirred him up. What's this about laboring for God and offerings and giving and helping and all this? It's when your heart gets stirred. He commanded them, but he said not all would do. But your heart got stirred. When I got saved, it, hey, it wasn't long that I was doing everything that you could do in a church. My heart got stirred. Everything they asked me to do, I did it. I worked a full-time job, worked five, six days a week. I had to drive an hour back to work and an hour back from work had to take a shower at the mines change at the mines took a whole lot of time to put a day in I began teaching Sunday school I began leading the singing in the, in the church and, and singing in the choir even when we were up at Tabernacle first thing I did was get in the choir get in, get in the choir you know he said their hearts got stirred and once when they got stirred Everyone whom his spirit made willing. Sometimes you can get your heart stirred up to do something, but your spirit's not willing to do it. What is that spirit? It's that God-conscious part of you and I. Again, God made you in his image. That doesn't mean you look like God. No man has seen God at any time. We don't know what God looks like. But he made you of what's called a trinity or a trichotomy. Uh, when you look up the word trichotomy, a lot of times it'll put a red line under it. It'll recognize dichotomy. Dichotomy means two that make up one. Trichotomy is three that make up one. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You are body, world conscious. Your soul, self conscious. And your spirit is God conscious. God made you in the image of God. When he breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, he became a living soul, not a living body. He became a living soul, something inside of the body that God made. So what happened was he said that every one of them whose spirit made willing. That tells me they came, their hearts were stirred, and their spirit was willing. Notice in verse 21, and they brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation and for all his service and for the holy garments. Boy, they started bringing it in, bringing in everything that was needed. All the workers, people coming in and volunteering to do the work. A lot of this was not just skilled work. A lot of it was hard labor. You've got laborers just like you've got somebody who runs it. That's why the Bible declares that you're to get knowledge. Knowledge is learning fact. Wisdom is putting the facts to work. And with all thy getting, get understanding. That's knowing how it works and why it works. All right. So you've got, he's setting up uh, a, a, a work relationship with these people. Everybody in the church can work and do something in the church. It may not be skilled. It may be labor. But he said this, for all his service and for the holy garments. So he had the people that were stirred up. They brought to the Lord the offering of the work, and they showed up for the work to get the job done. Verse number 22, and they came, both men and women. Women are not second-class citizens in the church. The church just simply bans them from doing a couple of three things. One, they cannot be a pastor or preacher in the church. I think First Timothy chapter 2 settles that for time and eternity. All right? These churches got women in the pulpit. They don't know what the Word of God said. He said, I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority, but to be in silence in the church. Now, that doesn't mean she can't talk. 
but it means that God has disqualified them. That's why if a man seek the office of a bishop or a man the deacon of the church, the office of the bishop, the deacon must be the husband of one wife. Now I know we live in days when that's all tossed up in the air. Uh, unfortunately, people can't look in the mirror and detect what gender they are. I don't know. I don't know if they just. I guess they got the spiritual blinders of sin on them. So we live in the days of sodomy, and that's what transgender is. It's just simply sodomy. And once again, one day I'll get kicked off of here, but that's all right. We're not going to be political correct for Facebook. Uh, we're going to preach the Word of God. But we find men and women, listen, they all had a job to do. Ladies, you've got a job to do in the church. If it wasn't for the ladies in this church, you'd be surprised how little would get done. Boy, I've got some gals in this church are fire and forget. I mean, tell you, I tell them, can you do this? And then I walk off and don't give it a second thought from that point on. Very skilled to do that. Vacation, Bible school, and other things for the cleaning of the church or whatever. All I've got to do is just say, can you do this and walk off and go home and leave it alone? Thank God they get it done. If it wasn't for the women in the church, the churches would be in trouble. They'd be in bad trouble. All right, ladies, you are a necessity. You are not a second-class citizen. Just God simply made you different for a different purpose. God didn't make you to be men. Boy, you get out here in the world, and let me tell you, women get hurt out here in the world. They get hurt out here. I still say it's a man's world outside of that home. Not that a woman can't function in it. She can. But, friends, she gets hurt out here. God made men and women different. Everybody, everybody good with that? He made you different in your purpose, different in your skill set. He made you different in your thinking. Different in your emotions. God made you to be everything that sorry rascal you're married to is not. <laughs> That's why he made Eve a help meet. If I meet somebody, I meet them face to face, and at that time they are a polar opposite. My right ear is where their left ear is. My left ear is where their right ear is. Everything's backward. You ever look in a mirror? It's hard for me to do stuff looking in a mirror because everything's backward, all right? It just it messes everything up. You ladies are everything that man is not, and you are the completer, not the competer. You're the completer. You're what makes him work. The importance. They came, both men and women, as many as were willing-hearted. Now, we're going to stop right there and we'll pick it back up but I'm trying to give some practical things that building the church it takes men it takes women it takes willingness we have everything we need in this church to take care of the church we don't have to have outside things to bring in money for anything we don't do that folks we live within our budget how many got a budget how many like the word budget? You women don't like it. I, men don't like it. All right, what's a budget? That's something the government hasn't done in decades. Did you know a budget is law? Our law says that our government will produce a budget every year. And they never produce one at all. A budget, amen. God has in here today, men and women, everything we need to get the job done. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for the day. I pray, Father, that you would be with our people that are out. Lord, we've got people vacationing. I pray for their safety. I pray, Father, for our people that are sick. I pray for Harold and Carol and Joan and pray for those today. But Lord, just pray you'd give us a good day today, Lord. Meet the need of every heart. I pray you'd honor the word of God this morning. Uh, Lord, as we preach the Word of God, uh, help me to rightly divide the Word of Truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to go to the Sunday school classes. No, we're not. We're going to go.